Hello, and welcome to The Sassy Show, sisters about support, service, engagement, and encouragement. Talking about a real sassy sister today. <laughs> Joining me today is Councilwoman Lores Barroso de Padilla. Welcome to the show. We're so happy to have thank you. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Well, thank you so much. Before we get into all the other things that you're doing uh, as a part of City Council, talk to us about your role at City Council, why uh, you chose to be a city council member, and what that means to you. Sure. So um, I started off my career as an AmeriCorps member. AmeriCorps is a corporation for national and community service. So as a younger person, I had the opportunity to serve my community right at the heart. And mm -hmm. so I was working to turn an old church into a community center here on the south side of Columbus. And at 17, um, you know, bright-eyed with my team yes. of 17 to 25-year-olds, we started these programs, but no one was coming. Mm -hmm. And so we realized that we actually decided what the community needed before ever really having the conversation with the community. So at 17, I started knocking on doors and hearing from people about what they wanted in their community. So it was at that time that I knew that service was always going to be a part of my life. This community-based work would always be a part of my life. And then fast forward, um, many years forward, um, I had the opportunity to work on some presidential campaigns. I yes. continued to work at City Air. And I started to um, see a path for myself kind of in public service, a different form of public service, right? Yes. Always working at the community level. Um, I really believe that social change happens with policy change. That's one aspect yes. of it. And so, um, you know, in the 50-some years, my parents are Cuban. They're fr um, first-generation first American. Mm -hmm. uh, in the 50 years that my parents have been in this country, they'd never seen anyone who looked like them um, really leading the city and mm -hmm. making decisions for them, being at a table, making decisions on their behalf. So all of these things kind of came to a head during the pandemic. And yes. I really started to see a very fragile system that we laid a pandemic on top of, and we started to see social unrest. We started to see some of the things that uh, a lot of people who look like you and I had been experiencing for a for, long time, yes. but the world was really starting to experience alongside of us. Yes. And so when there were changes happening at City Council, I really started to see a path for myself and started to see that someone like me with my experiences, both my life experiences and professional experiences, could bring a very different lens to council. Yes. Um, taking into account the growth of our city, the fact that immigrants, migrants, and refugees are the number one factor behind our growth. So all of these things kind of came, uh, became very clear to me during the time when people were starting sourdough starters and blow ups <laughs> and that, yeah, workout routines. I was yes. like, I should run I for should office. Run. Yes, so, yes. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Thank and you. That and running for office, you became the first Latina uh, council right. person in the city of Columbus. So we thank you for stepping up and making sure that people who look like you, people you. black and brown, but people who look like you yes. can see a pathway for them in the future. Well, and also with the shared experience. With the shared experience. I find that thank whether you. it's folks from the Asian diaspora or thank African you. diaspora, if you're a first generation or an immigrant, yes. you've had a very like experience with some nuances because of our cultures. Mm -hmm. But uh, the understanding that we have when we mm -hmm. talk together in community mm -hmm. is one that is so shared that really I feel like I'm representing a much larger group of folks in the community that haven't always had that voice. And thank you. And thank you for underscoring shared experiences because that really is what it's all about. Absolutely. And so when you think about the immigrant community, we're going to start there sure. uh, in this city mm -hmm. and we will have a very strong and very rich immigrant community here. Talk about the work that you're doing in that space, if you would. Sure, sure. So as I said, immigrants, migrants, and refugees yes. are the number one factor That's behind right. our population growth. The city, Columbus, has always been a resettlement city, meaning mm -hmm. that we've had the infrastructure uh, through our nonprofit organizations and, and actually official, uh, official designations from the government to make uh, organizations resettlement organizations, meaning that they can take in refugees. Yes. So when there's a conflict in some other part of the world, they will look to organizations mm -hmm. that are here in Columbus mm -hmm. to help resettle people. Yes. And so um, that's why we have had a long heritage of having, that's yes, how my parents have. actually came. One of the reasons that they came to Columbus was because of that long held kind of um, resettlement that was available here in services. Um, we've been doing a series of town halls called yes. Immigrants Make Columbus, mm -hmm. which which um, my office, myself and both my aides are all first generation American. And that was really 
important to me because I thought that brings a different perspective and lens to the work. It's also, when we talk about representation, having Latinas in this space yes. is not something that we had seen for a, a long time. Mm -hmm. Again, first generation Americans. And so um, we really wanted the work to come from the community. And so this work that we've done has led us to um, understanding both from a policy perspective, what are some things that we need to change? Mm -hmm. um, what are some things in terms of access? But also, how do we continue to have a strong representation from that community, aside from having one or two folks in office? Yes. So we are looking at actually putting together a IRMA immigrant, refugee, and migrant, it's going to have a better name, but council that could really be like an advisory group to the city of Columbus. And when I say the city of Columbus, I don't just mean myself as an elected official or the mayor yes. or a council. I mean, anyone in the city, yes. right? So at any time when we are dealing with um, different issues, you saw in the Haitian oh, community, yes, we had yes. some issues at Colonial Village. Mm -hmm. um, when things like this happen, when communities have essentially been bamboozled, been brought here yes. under another premise, and then don't have the mechanisms to support them. To address This advisory it. council can really act as a council to really help guide some of our decision making. And you said this uh, when you were 17 years old and you were doing work. One of the things that, that really was an aha moment for you was you were doing the work, but you weren't including the voices, and you really flipped that. This work, it seems as though you are lifting up the voices of the community and then developing programming or solutions based upon what you're hearing. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, that's one of my biggest lessons yes. from being an AmeriCorps member and mm -hmm. working at City Air and, and doing true community organizing mm -hmm. um, is that many times, uh, you know, any street in Columbus you could drive by and you could see a vacant lot. And yes. in your mind, you could imagine all the things that could go there. Right. Mm -hmm. Because you imagine this neighborhood mm -hmm. and why you come here. Mm -hmm. But the people who live there every day, the mm -hmm. people who drive past that same street, mm -hmm. that same lot, they have a very different idea of what their neighborhood needs because they actually they live, live there. there. What to expect when you're expecting. Like here? A teenager. Today, I'm going to show you how to teen-proof your home. First step, hide the car keys. Preferably somewhere they would never look. Challenges will come up. Be ready for them. Hi, honey. Ready for the- Mom, you don't use mannequins in the mannequin challenge. You don't have to know it all to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today, and we are so excited to have you. Thank you for having me. Well, first of all, Golden Heart, the Gold Heart Outreach. Mm -hmm. What is that organization all about? We are about supporting our unhoused neighbors any way we can. Mm -hmm. So just providing the gap between some of the resources. A lot of times when people are facing housing insecurity or they're already outside, living outside, they have a really hard time getting resources. You can, there's all kinds of phone numbers and great things that they give you, but um, it's hard to actually know the steps and who to talk to. And so we kind of try to pare back some of that extra stuff that makes mm -hmm. it more difficult for folks. How did it start? Um, well, about, I started it myself about 11 years ago. Okay. Um, we've been doing it really full time here um, for the past two. Um, I was actually uh, sex trafficked um, mm -hmm. as a teen and young adult mm -hmm. and ended up here in Columbus, Ohio. Um, I'm from the Detroit area and um, I was really helped um, a lot by some um, just random folks. Mm -hmm. um, helped me to get my get away, get my life yes. on track yes. and it left such an impression on me. Um, I knew that that's what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to help um, other women, men, um, who had been through similar, yes, um, to uh, to get that support that they need because um, in in this kind of um, in that kind of industry itself, 
it really helps to have somebody who knows what you've been through because mm -hmm. it's such a unique experience. Yes, yes, yes. And so taking that experience that you encountered and someone helped you and many someone's helped <laughs> you, what, how do you support and help the unhoused here now? Sure. Um, so I actually more act as a liaison, I should say we, act as a liaison um, between the community and folks who are unhoused. Mm -hmm. So I've recognized over the years that most people really want to help. Yes. Um, they really do. They just don't know how. And a lot of folks think the only thing that they can do is give money or mm -hmm. that's really not true. Um, so what I've been able to do is kind of bridge that gap also where you know, if I have um, an immigrant family that moved in and they really don't have anything, they've finally been housed, they have nothing, I can then reach out, I'm that trusted community member that can reach out to the folks in the community and they will, oh hey, I have a bed, I have these things, I have this gas card, I would love to donate a meal, I would, it's all these people that want to help so badly, they're just waiting for that opportunity. And so I try to bring that opportunity to them mm -hmm. and make it as easy on them as they can so that they, they get to do that you know that wonderful deed yes. um, and help others um, and, you know but I, I can facilitate that so it's wonderful. Well you know there are other organizations in the community that are doing things to help address the unhoused situation here mm -hmm. in our community and we have um, a number of organizations that are helping to address that. Absolutely. How is your organization different? What are some of the things that you do differently? Uh, I know there's a lot of similarities and that you do a number of things because the need is great and the sure. need is similar. But what are some of the things that you do that might be a little different than some of the other organizations? Sure. Um, the most important thing I think that we uh, provide to the community is um, winter outreach. So. Um, the shelters, you know, I, I don't know if you all know, but we have Van Buren Shelter here in Columbus off of Mound Street, and Van Buren is the largest shelter in the United States. Did not know that. It is, and it is also the um, only one in the world that houses men, women, and families under one roof. In the world, right in the here world. in Columbus, mm -hmm. Ohio? So it's, it's pretty amazing what they do out there. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it, it takes hundreds and hundreds of employees and volunteers to do what they do. Um, unfortunately, though, when the really bad weather hits here, the shelters fill up pretty quickly. Yes. And historically, the city um, has struggled to meet that need. Um, <clears throat> they do the very best they can, but it's, it is a, a big struggle. And so um, when the shelters fill up and people need rides, they, mm -hmm. you know, they'll usually open like a warming station where people can go yes, at night, understood. get some food. Um, but the issue we ran into is that our folks had no way to get there. Um, the buses kind of s stop a little early mm -hmm. and so our, our folks had no way to get there and so we started giving people rides and saying hey if you need a ride we'll you know call us we'll Provide come get it. you. Mm -hmm. Our first night we ever did that we had over a hundred people and we realized this is a this huge a gap need. that that is needed um, and so now we've been doing that for several years now and now we're hoping to be known as the folks that do that because we want to get that word out that if you're sleeping in your car and it's it's freezing you call us we're going to come make sure that you're safe we're going to you know if we have to get you propane anything we can do to keep you warm mm -hmm. we want to make sure that you make it through mm -hmm. this this mm -hmm. night and so that is something that we do that i'm not aware of any other organizations doing in the city um so i i would really love to expand on that i'd love to one day have a van or something that we can really pick everybody up in, mm -hmm. and so really working on those goals this year. Excellent, because right now it's you and maybe a friend or so picking up and transporting. Is that how that's working now? Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, and mm -hmm. we were very, very lucky. We got donated a van um, by Northland Excellent. Heating and Cooling. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. it didn't, um, it, it made us a couple years, and it yes. was wonderful, but mm -hmm. now we're in the market for another, <laughs> so mm -hmm. as it happens. Um, but yes, mm -hmm. yes. So you mentioned something earlier and about the unhoused and others. People really do want help and people are working to improve their situations often. Mm -hmm. Share what you see in the unhoused population and um, share a story of, of, I don't know, family person who really sometimes find their way being unhoused in that situation mm -hmm. and looking to move out of that and how that journey 
have, in terms of resources and other things that sure. you offer, helps them get from that point to a different point? Sure. Um, there's a saying that an old mentor of mine here in Columbus uh, told me that Columbus is resource rich, but connection poor. Mm -hmm. Meaning that we are incredibly lucky, and I can say this coming from my hometown of Detroit, um, we're incredibly lucky in the services that we do have here. Um, but it's again connecting the folks to them. Yes. Some of them, for example, you know, we've been doing this about 11 years mm -hmm. and all the time people still don't really know who we are. Yes. And so it's getting that out there mm -hmm. is, is the biggest part. Um, my mentor, a story I'd love to share, um, to back up very quickly, I strongly believe in meeting people where they are. Yes. You can never go to someone just as, as with anyone. You can't go to someone yeah. and say, hey, do this. Right. The people have to see something inside themselves that they feel worth it mm -hmm. to want to make those choices. Mm -hmm. I know you've been grinding. I know things aren't easy. I wonder if you know that we can get help. Love your mind. I'm Kazmir Pearson, I'm a family nurse practitioner, and I'm the owner-operator of Pearson Medical Services and Weight Loss. Uh, so I'm originally from Youngstown, Ohio. Um, I went to school in Brookfield, Ohio, graduated um, from there, then went to Capital University for undergrad, where I majored in biology and minored in psychology. Um, I then went on to go to OSU, and I graduated with my master's in nursing from OSU, where I became a family nurse practitioner. So I recently opened a, it's virtual, well it's a hybrid practice, um, and we specialize in medical weight loss. We offer medications that get shipped directly to the patients, um, and they can start their weight loss journey from home. We also, uh, we also offer convenient care, um, so I do some primary care things like um, if you have an earache or a UTI or something like that, I can also help in that area. So it's easy, you don't even have to leave your house. Um, you just go on my website at www.pearsonmedicalservices.com. Uh, you click on the link um, and you request an appointment right from the website. I'll get a notification that you have an appointment and whatever your needs are. You complete the initial paperwork um, and then I'll get on and we'll schedule, schedule a time and you talk to me about whatever it is that you need and we get you taken care of without, without you even having to leave your house. Uh, most important issues I think is access to care. COVID really opened up the telehealth, the virtual appointments for everybody, which allowed people to have better access to their family doctors, to specialists, just by being at home. A lot of patients struggle with transportation issues, um, insurance issues, and so having the virtual option is a lot cheaper for a lot of people and helps them be able to get to, to get the primary care or the health care they need without even leaving their house. Oh, there's such a big need for mental health, especially in the African-American community. Um, I am probably, well, I'm the, in the minority of being a black family nurse practitioner. Um, and so a lot of times we, we, when we don't have providers that look like us, we don't wanna go to the doctors because they don't understand where we come from. They don't understand our culture or our, our needs um, when it comes to mental health. So 
it's, it's just it's, it's just a, a big need and we need more providers that look like the people that we're serving so the biggest i think barrier is that um one the cost of school um and two we just we don't go into fields like um it, it, we don't go into healthcare. A lot of African American people go into social work, they go into criminology, and unfortunately, those positions, although they do serve the community, um, you get paid significantly less by going into those uh, fields, and it's easier to get in. There's not a bunch of testing and stuff that's required to get into those fields, whereas if you go to medical school or, or nursing school, there's tests to get in, there's a minimum. Um, standard that you have to meet and it just creates a lot more barriers if you don't have the background or the mentors that other people that aren't african-american have I, I know myself growing up i didn't have um anyone to kind of guide me going to college um i was a first generation college kid and so i went to one of the most expensive schools in columbus <laughs> not knowing that um I should have went to state school. I went to a private school, so I have a significant amount of debt. And sometimes that deters people to go on and continue school. But I was like, oh, well, I got the debt and I'm just gonna finish at this point. But, um, you know, it'll make a lot of people choose other cheaper fields. And so you see that lag where there isn't, there isn't as many African-American people going into healthcare or those, those more fields where, where we need it, really. Um, so I'm not the first to go, but I'm the first to finish. <laughs> and so if you know anything about the United States, a lot of people go to college, but now everyone finishes. Um, and then you have tons of student loans and stuff, but, um, and you don't have the degree to, to, to back you up. But, um, I, I finished and it, it means so much to me. It has one broken generational curses for me and, and my family. Um, I'm able to provide for my family in a way that I might not have been able to do had I not went to college and graduated and, and, and finished. Um, but and it also helps me inspire my, my younger, the next generation, my nieces, my nephews, and let them know you don't have to just, you don't have to just go to college, but, but it is a way, it is an escape from poverty, it is an, an escape from the same old stuff that we know and what we see in our neighborhoods. Um, I've really been able to elevate my life because I did go to college and I finished. Uh, myths from patients, I, I say, especially when it comes to mental health, um, and and the and the myths have some some you, we should understand them because they come from somewhere. It comes from a place of fear and and um, being misunderstood. And so medication, no, no, a lot of my, my black patients, they don't want to be on medication. They heard what medication can do. Um, and so it's a tool that we uh, eliminate uh, then because we don't, because we're afraid of the medication. When in fact, you can be on mental health medication. You don't have to be on it forever. Um, and it can definitely help you in your, in your life to, to deal with the things you may have to deal with. Um, but there is a big fear amongst, especially the black community, about a surrounding medication. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, that it, it's a myth, but it, it actually has some some statistical evidence that some doctors um, don't take pain seriously. Is it was the main one that has been studied. They don't take the pain seriously from African American people. So when if you go to the doctor and you say I'm having eight out of ten pain a lot of times they overlook that. And um, I think it's still true today. And I think it's still something as, as healthcare providers that we have to work on um, because the system was never set up for us to begin with. Um, and so uh, you'll see a, a lot of doctors have to take competencies and different things to become more culturally diverse um, and, and being able to serve the community that they work in. But that, that's in fact true that a lot of times we are underdiagnosed, we are undertreated. Yeah, men don't like to go to the doctors whatsoever. Um, usually, it's a lot of time, I do have a lot of men that come in and they came in on their own. A lot of time is my wife said I had to come. My wife is making me come. My mom's making me come. And it's, and it's women that are pushing men to go to the doctors, which is 
uh, can be a bad thing because then there's a delay in us catching certain things um, because men won't come to the doctors and do their annual appointments and get their lab work. So a lot of times we find out later, oh, you had diabetes all this time um, or, you know, you had heart disease, but because we weren't going to the doctor and, and doing those annual visits like we should, um, that we find out later. I think that they're going to continue. I think when we had COVID, they realized that there's there's a big need and that we can eliminate so many barriers for patients if we just offer a phone call or if we offer a video visit. It's amazing to me that like we have Facebook, we have Instagram, we have all these huge platforms that everyone has access to, but not everyone in our country has access to healthcare. Um, and so I think that they can't go back at this point and that's kind of what made me start my practice is that I can see you at home. We can work on your weight loss goals. You don't have to necessarily come in and, and see me. And I think a big portion of it is trusting, trusting the person, trusting my patient to care and be invested in the in their in their own health care. That you know, a lot of doctors are like, no, you have to come in so I can listen to your heart one time and look into your nose. And I can look at your nose <laughs> from the video. You know, I it, it's not always necessary that you have to have um, a full examination for every little little thing and it's and if we create that barrier to where you have to come into the office or I can't you know or you can't get health care and that that just shouldn't be yeah we we've, we've definitely come full circle full circle with that because a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of practices now that do in-home assessments um, and, and with the doctors or nurse practitioners or nurses will come to their house um, and, and do an appointment and we should be able to offer that uh, to patients, especially like we, we're an aging population. Um, the boomers are, are, are getting older, so they can't come out all the time. And it, especially if you live in Ohio where the weather's bad and you know trying to set up transportation through Medicaid, it is a huge thing. So if we can come to them, if we can bring healthcare to them, then that would make us to have a, a healthier community overall. So you can either look on my website at www.pearsonmedicalservices.com. Um, we offer weight loss, we offer convenient care. You can go right there and book an appointment on the calendar. You, I get the request um, and then we set up a time. And even if you can't get on there and book an appointment, you can call, you can text me um, and you'll, it'll be me that's replying to you. Um, or you can come, I have an office located at 125 West Main Street. It's in Circleville, Ohio. Um, so if you need an inpatient, uh, in-person visit, we can offer that too as well. So just have to let me know, reach out, text me, <laughs> and um, you know, we can set something up.